The Bad Batch is finally over, and I couldn't be happier to see it go. While Filoni cultists spent May the 4th grieving the ending of their favourite show, or celebrating the first plural character in Star Wars, I spent my 4th of May seething in rage at what Filoni did to one of my favourite characters of the franchise, Scourge. Okay, maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, I'm not quite that up in arms about this, but I do hate to see such a cool character from Legends brought down to just generic henchman number 5 in canon. I wasn't going to bother making a video about this, this show isn't even worthy of a dedicated review, but right now there's nothing else interesting to cover in the world of movies and TV, so I figured I might as well make a follow up to my old series, The Bad Batch Ruined Republic Commandos. I started this series back when the last season aired, and I made three videos addressing the disgraceful treatment of clone commandos in this show. One video about commandos in general, one about Gregor, and one about Scorch. Now in that video about Scorch, I actually somewhat defended the show's depiction of the character as it had been portrayed so far up until that point. Most people were saying this cold, ambitious robotic henchman is nothing like the Scorch we all know and love from the game, and although I agree with them, I did attempt to add some further context and nuance to that argument. I brought up Scorch's character arc in the Legends book series Republic Commando, where he starts out as the fun-loving jokester from the games, but throughout the course of the war he loses a lot of his light aside, and he becomes something much colder, more ruthless, and even a little unhinged. I made the argument that the depiction of Scorch in The Bad Batch Season 2 was actually somewhat in keeping with where his story was left off at the end of the last book, Imperial Commando. But I also made sure to say I am under no illusions that this was done on purpose. I do not believe Filoni and his team have ever even read the books. Any similarities in the depictions is purely coincidental. I'm not even sure the Bad Batch team have even played the game at all, because if they had, they couldn't possibly have gotten him so wrong compared to his character in that game. Okay, so why am I making this follow-up video then? Because I know now how Scorch's story ends in this show, and it puts things into a very different perspective. Any good grace I may have shown the Bad Batch depiction in the past has gone out the window. This show is essentially a lesson in exactly the worst possible way to do fan service, to the point where it actually astounds me that anybody could be this stupid. The levels of retardation are so staggering that I'm starting to think it goes beyond incompetence and strays into the territory of malice. So before I go any further, I have to give a spoiler warning. Even though this isn't a full review, it will still contain spoilers mostly pertaining to Scorch's character. But let's be real, with a show as bad as this one, most people aren't going to give a damn about spoilers anyway. If you liked the show so much, you would have already clicked off the video after I called you a Filoni cultist in the first sentence, so I hardly think a spoiler warning is necessary. Also, if you're a returning viewer, you might be confused at how different the tone of this video is compared to my more serious reviews that I've done lately. But those of you who have been with me from the start will know that this is how my channel originally began, harshly criticizing Star Wars content that does not do justice to the franchise that I loved as a kid. So in reality, this is a return to form for me, even if only for one video. Alright, let's talk Scorch, the cheerful light-hearted demolitions expert from the legendary Delta Squad. In Legends, Delta Squad was the top performing clone commando squad in the Republic Special Operations Brigade. When Chancellor Palpatine specifically requested the best of the best in his mission to track down Kamino and Chief Scientist Ko Sai, General Alagan Z chose Delta Squad. The Special Operations Brigade consisted of 10 commando groups, roughly 5,000 commandos, and Delta Squad was the best of them. By that metric, it could be said that Scorch was one of the four most elite clone commandos in the entire army, which would most likely put him within the top 1% of all clones in existence at the end of the Clone Wars and the rise of the Empire. Sure, there would have been some advanced recon commandos out there who were probably more dangerous than Scorch, but that's about it. And just for clarity's sake, when I refer to commandos in this video, I'm generally referring to Republic commandos who later became Imperial commandos, not advanced recon commandos. If I mention advanced recon commandos again, I will call them ARCs as they are supposed to be called, not ARC troopers. That's a useless feloniism we can do without. Adding troopers to the end of ARC is completely redundant and it bothers me way more than it should, as you might be able to tell. Anyway, back to clone commandos. These guys were leagues above the regular infantry clone troopers, who were already very skilled fighters, as we've seen countless times in both Legends and Canon. All throughout the Clone Wars TV show, Filoni and his team have never shied away from showing clone troopers as the absolute beasts that they are, and for that I give him credit. But the problem arises when you start looking back at those depictions and contrasting it with the depictions of Imperial commandos in the Bad Batch, if the clone troopers were beasts in Clone Wars, the commandos should be absolute monsters in this show, Scorch most of all, and yet they just aren't. 
So just like last time I analyzed the clone commandos in the Bad Batch Season 2, I want to start again by comparing and contrasting the capabilities in Legends versus Disney canon. Clone commandos in Legends are trained for infiltration, assassination, sabotage, asset denial, counter espionage, counter terrorism, hostage rescue, close quarters battle, fugitive hunting, zero gravity shipboarding, survival behind enemy lines, resistance to interrogation, and even Jedi hunting after Order 66. These guys are probably the closest thing the Kaminoans ever got to creating the perfect soldier with the possible exception of Arx, and Scorch was the best of the best. On a more individual level, Scorch in particular was the demolitions expert, the breacher, the guy who loved to use heavy weapons and explosives. He literally got his name from an accident with explosives in training that singed his eyebrows off. But he wasn't only the explosives guy. He, like all commandos, was also an expert marksman, a wizard with computers and circuits, and an all-round elite warfighter. So with all those capabilities, you'd think he'd make for a pretty intimidating antagonist in the Bad Batch, right? Wrong. Because what do we actually see him doing in the show? Essentially just standing around looking cool, jumping to obey Hemlock's every order with all the competence of an Imperial Army cadet. Granted, in his first appearance, he does put up a somewhat decent resistance against the Bad Batch and Gregor, but he still goes down too easily and it's only downhill from there. In Season 2, all he really does is go around rounding up civilians then drop down from the sky like a ninja to capture Omega. If you thought that was bad, his potential is even more wasted in Season 3. He literally does nothing. Not one useful thing in the entire season. He could be replaced by a faceless Imperial and nothing would change. He does not get one single cool moment in the entire season, nor does he get any moment of humanity or decency. Not even a faint flicker of the old Scorch inside. He just gets shot and falls off a bridge. The end. Bye Scorch, was nice knowing you. So glad Filoni brought you out of the expanded universe only to kill you off like a weak little bitch. Guess it's your corpse getting spat on this time, huh? And it's not just Scorch who is wasted, all the commandos are. They started out pretty pathetic in their first appearance, but over the course of the show they've just been disrespected more and more and undercut at every step of the way. They go down way too easy in every firefight, they flee like cowards from a baby Zillow beast before getting eaten, they miss their shots from two meters away, they can't even do guard duty properly. I've addressed all these points in more detail in my first video on this topic so I won't go over it all again, but my point is the Bad Batch essentially just took the coolest unit in all of Star Wars and reduced them down to stormtroopers with glowing visors. It's pathetic. Now, Scorch's personality. I said in my original video that the show wasn't as off base as people thought, but I no longer feel that way. There's still some overlap between Scorch we see in the later books and the version in the show, but there's a lot that is directly contradicted in the show. The clone commandos in those books, pretty much all of them including Scorch, are fiercely loyal to their brothers, their fellow clones. Jango Fett himself hired a hundred of the galaxy's best bounty hunters and mercenaries to personally train the clone commandos on Kamino, and most of those training officers were Mandalorians. Brotherhood and family are extremely strong Mandalorian values, and I'm talking about the real Mandalorians here, not Filoni and Favreau's butchery of the culture in modern Disney Star Wars. But with the clone commandos, those values of family and brotherhood became even more sacred because that was all they had. Clones did not have rights, they did not have freedoms, and with a very few limited exceptions, they did not have wives or kids to go back home to between deployments. Their brotherhood was all they had. You see it most with Omega Squad, the main clone commando characters in the books. They loved every clone they met as a brother, and it really upset them when they encountered a clone unit who was openly hostile towards them due to their Mandalorian heritage. Darman from Omega Squad, who is one of my all-time favorite characters, had an especially world-shattering experience with some fellow clones after finding an Ark Deserter on one of the worlds he deployed to. He and his sniper, Fire, tracked this Ark Deserter to his apartment, where they fought and overcame him, taking him back to their campsite for a different Ark to deal with. After much deliberation, the Ark Deserter ended up getting smuggled off-world, a decision that Omega Squad were not overly involved in, but then Darman was sent back to the Deserter's apartment to clean it up and make sure that he had left no trace. While he was there, he was attacked by two unknown men who had mistaken him for the Deserter, after all, all clones do look the same, remember. Darman killed the two attackers, but when he went to check their bodies, he realized, much to his dismay, they were both clones. Republic Intelligence had sent Covert Ops clones to track down and execute the Ark Deserter, and Darman had killed them. This seriously affected Darman, as you can imagine, and he really struggled to come to terms with the fact that he had killed two of his brothers, even though he had never met them and they had been trying to kill him at the time. Now why do I bring this up? What does it have to do with Scorch? Well, it speaks to how much the clone commandos cared about their brothers, their fellow clones, even the ones from other units who they had never crossed paths with before. And whilst Delta Squad is not Omega Squad, and Scorch is not Darman, I believe Scorch still shared that same loyalty to his kin. 
Delta were definitely a lot less sociable than Omega. The infantry clones tended to give them a wide berth, either out of respect or fear, and Delta were more than happy with that arrangement. But that does not mean that Delta did not care. In fact, the very thing that pushed Scorch over the edge, the very incident that turned him from a cheerful jokester into a killer more ruthless and brutal than Sev, was an incident in which he saw a bunch of his clone brothers brutally dismembered and killed in a missile attack. Delta Squad, Omega Squad, and their Jedi General were all stationed on a Republic outpost near the end of the war. They were deployed there to combat a bunch of Separatist sympathizers who were essentially just space Al-Qaeda. Delta Squad were in the mess hall, eating with the other clones when a missile struck. In an instant, the sanctity of the mess hall was transformed into a bloody hellscape right before Scorch's eyes. He saw a clone decapitated with a flying metal tray, flung across the room by the explosive blast. He saw numerous clone lives snuffed out, not on the battlefield where they had a fighting chance, but in the sanctity of their own cafeteria. Men who, moments earlier, had been sitting down and eating with their brothers, off duty, and now one of them was missing the top of his head. Scorch saw all of this and he snapped. I told this story in my last Scorch video, but I think it's worth telling again. When Delta Squad and Omega Squad arrive at the missile launch site, Scorch specifically requests to join Omega Squad on the breach team. We don't get to see exactly what he does inside because the scene is written from Darman's perspective outside, but we do know that Scorch blows half the roof off in his seething desire for vengeance. Then he drags each of the dead insurgents out into the street for all their neighbors to see, lines up their bodies, and sprays them all point blank with blaster fire, emptying an entire magazine. Then, he spits on each of their corpses. He's so far gone that his Jedi General has to use the Force to influence his mind and help put the pieces back together and pull him back from the brink of insanity. That's how much Scorch cares about his brothers. So, why am I mentioning all this then? Because I do not believe he would ever agree to hunt down his fellow clones the way he's been hunting down the Bad Batch and Omega. The only circumstances I can see in which he might do this is if they had been murdering clones all over the place, but as far as I can recall, the Bad Batch doesn't really kill clones all that much, especially not at the start. They don't even really kill stormtroopers much. They seem to use stun in almost every situation they can and only shoot live fire rounds when things get truly desperate and it becomes a matter of life and death. Now, you might say Hemlock could have manipulated Scorch and lied to him to make him believe the Bad Batch are doing all these horrible things, and that's why Scorch is okay with the assignment. But if that's your view, I think you're very much overestimating Hemlock's capabilities and underestimating Scorch's intellect. Scorch outsmarts Hemlock any day of the week. It's not even a comparison. Remember, in the books, when Palpatine asked for the best of the best, the Republic sent Delta Squad. And that was a mission to track down the Kaminoan scientist who had gone on the run. Not a mission for brawn over brains. Not a mission where Scorch could just go in blasting his DC-17 anti-armor. It was a mission that required careful thought and investigation, sifting through intelligence, gathering clues. And the only reason they didn't succeed was because their own Mandalorian training sergeant beat them to it, along with Omega Squad's training instructor too. Scorch isn't dumb enough to be lied to and manipulated into going after his fellow clones, and I don't believe he would just blindly follow orders at the cost of his brother's lives. And you can't make the argument that he has a problem with clone deserters either, because half of Omega Squad deserted after Order 66, and Scorch showed no signs of animosity towards them when he spoke to the remaining members of the squad. Scorch's own training sergeant was helping clones desert, for goodness sake. Scorch did stay with the Empire, hunting down their fugitives, but he did not hunt down clones, he hunted down Jedi, because he hated Jedi by that point. He blamed them for what happened to Sev. So it's already not feeling like he's even close to the same character in terms of personality and the actions that he's taking in the show, but it doesn't stop there either. This show depicts Scorch as being completely loyal and subservient to Hemlock, the least threatening person ever, to the point where it becomes pathetic. The majority of the clones in the Republic Commando series have very little time or respect for non-clone officers, excluding Jedi, to the point where they literally started referring to them as mongrel officers. Scorch is no exception. His respect has to be earned, and if an officer fails to earn his respect like Hemlock would have, Scorch would certainly not be running around after him like a puppy eager to please. Nor would he give his life for that officer the way he did with Hemlock. There's absolutely nothing here to justify this level of unquestioning loyalty. All Hemlock has done is fail again and again while also torturing and experimenting on clones and hunting down deserters. Even the clones who still serve him mean nothing to him. They are all just expendable, less than human, pawns for him to play his games with. And those are games of personal ambition too, he cares only for the cause as much as it can benefit him. There is literally nothing Scorch would respect about this man, he's utterly contemptible. Then we have the fact that they didn't even get Scorch's rank right. He's apparently Commander Scorch now because Felony and the team don't have the faintest idea how Chain of Command works. 
In the vast majority of cases, clone commandos do not reach ranks higher than sergeant. They're privates and non-commissioned officers. They do not reach officer ranks. Now, there might be a few odd exceptions here and there in the more obscure Star Wars media out there, but in the mainline game and book series, we never see a commando officer. The higher ranks in their chain of command all seem to either be ARC officers or Jedi commanders and generals. But even if they could become officers, in what world is it possible for Scorch to have gone from a private at the end of the Clone Wars to a commander just a few years later? It makes no sense and ultimately I think it just comes down to the fact that Filoni thinks every cool clone has to be a captain or a commander. Except he didn't even make Scorch cool either. But when everyone's a commander, nobody is. The title ceases to have any meaning whatsoever. And besides that, Scorch is also not a lone wolf. The game is very, very, very clear about how suboptimal it is for commandos to split up and operate alone, and the books take that even further. Sure, commandos can operate on their own, but they do not intentionally deploy that way. It only happens out of necessity. And when it does, the only thing on their minds is to reunite with their squads as soon as possible. There's a quote from the books that sums it up perfectly. Cal Scarada, Omega Squad's Mandalorian training sergeant, says, Think of yourselves as a hand. Each of you is a finger. Without the others, you are useless. Alone, a finger can't grasp or control or form a fist. You are nothing on your own and everything together. Even in the game, Torn Wee says you are each a part of a whole person. Scorch should not be operating alone. It makes no sense. Where is Delta Squad? Sure, Sev might be missing in action, but where are Boss and Fixer? Hemlock literally says to Scorch at one point, you have the full resources of the Empire at your disposal when it comes to hunting down the kid, Omega. So why doesn't he call his old squad? People have theorized about this and come up with all kinds of headcanon to explain it away, but ultimately the show never addresses it. And Scorch is probably dead now, so we'll most likely never know. And that's where the retardation comes in. What would possess the writing team to think it was a good idea to include Scorch and never even mention the rest of his squad? Literally the very first thing on fans' minds when Scorch first appeared was, Awesome! I hope we get to see the rest of his squad! It goes back to that idea of unfulfilled promises that the writers made to the audience without even realizing it. I've talked about this before and people seem to struggle to grasp it, so I'm going to try to explain it better this time. Every story you tell will naturally include a bunch of unspoken promises to the audience, and the degree to which your story satisfies the audience will be proportional to how well you fulfill these promises. Some promises are very obvious and almost universal in all stories. For instance, at the very most basic level, if I pick up a new book, I can be pretty confident that it will not just cut off halfway through the story with no sequel, because that would be extremely unsatisfying and almost no author would ever do that. I'm not referring to cliffhangers here either, I mean literally if you just turn the page midway through a sentence and that was the end. Nobody's doing that because there's an unspoken promise between the writer and the reader that the writer will at least attempt to give a satisfying conclusion to the story. But not all promises are that obvious or universal. Another example that is often used in writing is the idea of Chekhov's gun. This rule in its original form states, one must never place a loaded rifle on the stage if it is not going to go off. It's wrong to make promises you don't mean to keep. It's about setup and payoff. You set up the fact that there's a weapon there, so now you have to pay it off or else that setup was wasted. Of course, even with an example like this, you can twist it so the payoff isn't quite so predictable. You could perhaps have the gun fail to fire when the time comes, or maybe the hero goes to the gun but the villain has moved it when nobody was paying attention. It doesn't overly matter how the payoff happens, though some options might be more satisfying than others. The real problem occurs if there's absolutely no payoff for anything whatsoever. If we saw the gun on the mantelpiece in the first act of the film, and the camera zoomed in on it and focused on it, but then during the final fight, none of the characters even think to go for the gun, it would be very frustrating because we, the audience, would be sitting there going, just use the gun. Come on, it's right there. Did you forget? Just pick up the gun and save yourself. What are you doing? And that's how it feels with Scorch and Delta Squad. Not that he's literally a Chekhov's gun, but his appearance does set up the subconscious promise to the audience. You showed us Scorch in Act 1. Scorch is one piece of a whole person according to the game. He's one finger on a hand according to the books. He is incomplete by himself. He needs his squad. So when we see him, the first thing we think is, okay, if Scorch is here, Delta Squad should be too. It doesn't matter if the writers didn't intend to set up that promise either. The fact of the matter is that the audience has that expectation whether the writers like it or not, and a skillful writer would have been able to recognize and predict that. A skillful writer would have either added something to satisfy that promise, or they would have made it very clear from the start that the promise was not going to be satisfied. What I'm saying is, obviously the coolest thing that could have happened would have been to just include Delta Squad in the show after showing Scorch. But if the writers were set on avoiding that, they could have found a way to let us know that they had no intention of satisfying that promise, instead of stringing us along for all these seasons only to disappoint right at the end. They could have had Scorch request the remainder of Delta Squad from Hemlock, but have his request denied. 
It'd be tough to justify a good reason why the squad is split up when they have such a good track record, but maybe the Empire doesn't like how close clone commandos were to their pod brothers. Maybe they split them up because they viewed that tight bond as a threat. They didn't want soldiers who were more loyal to each other than to the Empire. Or maybe they could have gone the other way. Maybe Hemlock tells Scorch that he's calling in the rest of the squad, but Scorch is against it. Maybe Scorch still blames Boss and Fixer for leaving Sev behind. Maybe he feels he can't work with them anymore. There's more than one way you could justify it, but all it would take is about two lines of dialogue to explain it away, and then the audience would be on board. We would understand why Delta Squad can't show up and save the day for Scorch. But instead of doing that, they just left it open, with no explanation for why Scorch and the Commandos as a whole deviated so far from their previously established lore. What a mess of missed opportunities. We could have had Delta Squad go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Bad Batch. That's something that people have been speculating on for years, the question of who would win, Delta or the Bad Batch. Admittedly, it could have also been very easily unsatisfying if Delta Squad just got annihilated by their retarded ripoff brothers, but it also could have been really cool depending how it was done. Alternatively, we could have had Delta Squad hunting them across the galaxy, but as they see more and more of the Bad Batch's actions, they realize that they are not as bad as the Empire has led them to believe. Maybe Hunter manages to have a face-to-face -face chat with Boss where he talks Boss around to his point of view and they work things out together. Delta Squad may not be ready to desert with the Bad Batch, but maybe they're sympathetic enough to help fake the deaths of the deserters, buying them a fresh start away from the Empire. Or maybe Delta Squad finds out about Hemlock's experimentation on their clone brothers and they join forces with the Bad Batch to help take him down. Maybe they do it in disguise so that the Empire doesn't even know it was them. Maybe afterwards they go back to working for the Empire, but as double agents for the Bad Batch or for the Rebellion. I'm not saying any of these specific ideas had to happen. I'm not even saying those are ideas that I would overly love to see. I'm just saying there was so many other ways we could have gone with this story. Ways which would have included Delta Squad and didn't just have Scorch breaking character and operating completely alone and separate to his squad. But okay, let's say you really are set on your stupid idea to only include Scorch. Could you at least try to do him justice, please? Could you at least give him access to all his equipment, weapons, and abilities? Like all commandos at the end of the Clone Wars, Scorch would have been kitted out in Mark III Catan class commando armor. Armor which is blaster proof up to small laser cannons, impervious to slug throwers and projectile weapons, hardened against EMPs, and strong enough to take a direct hit from a thermal detonator without injuring the wearer. It may have even been ray shielded like a droidica, though I suspect that's just a game mechanic and not a canonical feature. But the point is, not much short of a turbo laser or a lightsaber is going to get through this. That's how tough commandos are. Just kidding, in Dave Filoni's fanfic, Scorch goes down to a handful of stun rounds or like three to five single blaster shots. What a joke. How about his weapons? Well, as part of his standard loadout at this point in time, Scorch would have been outfitted with his DC-17M interchangeable weapon system. This weapon can be reconfigured on the fly to operate as a blaster rifle, a sniper rifle, anti-armor grenade launcher, pulsed energy projectile laser, which is not a stun round but it's functionally very similar, and a rapid entry breaching grenade. On top of that, he's also got his DC-15S sidearm and all the grenades and ordnance you would expect from a demolitions expert. Wait, never mind, he only remembered to pack his blaster rifle attachment, guys! I guess he left everything else in his locker this whole time, because not only is this version of Scorch incompetent, he's also hopelessly unprepared. Whatever happened to proper planning prevents piss poor performance, a phrase which was drilled into the commandos throughout their training on Kamino. Now granted, not all those weapons would have made sense for him to use in the course of the show, but it would have been nice to see at least a few of them show up here and there, and the fact that it, they didn't just shows that Filoni and the team know nothing about commandos or just don't care at all. And for a while, I thought the writers had just made Scorch and the other commandos incompetent because they needed the Bad Batch to beat them, and the writers themselves weren't skilled enough to write competent heroes overcoming competent villains. But then we got the Clone Assassins, which completely blew that argument out of the water. The Clone Assassins, Filoni's latest cringe OC-level fanfic characters, absolutely annihilate the Bad Batch, proving that he does know how to make villains who actually threaten the heroes. Filoni just didn't want to do it with the clone commandos for some brain dead reason. He chose his cancerous original characters over the well established fan favorite clone special forces because that's who Filoni is. It's who he's always been. His own creations will always come before fan favorites who were created by more talented people. And at this point it's starting to look intentionally malicious and hateful. It's starting to look like the only reason he even included clone commandos in this at all was because he was sick of people comparing the Bad Batch to Delta Squad and he wanted to settle it once and for all. 
So he brought in this severely cucked version of Scorch, then made his own characters easily triumph over him just to send the message that the Bad Batch are superior to Delta Squad. The made-up clone assassins are even apparently superior to Delta Squad. In Filoni's universe, everyone is superior to Delta Squad it seems, because when you're a creator with absolutely no talent, you have nothing left to rely on but tearing down the works of your betters. And just because I know someone will comment on this if I don't address it, yes, I know clone assassins existed in past lore as well, but not like this. These new ones in the fanfic Filoni-verse are infinitely less cool than the original ones. Just like Commandos, and Arcs, and Clones in general, and also Mandalorians and everything else Filoni has had a hand in corrupting. Scorch is dead, most likely, and Filoni killed him. Filoni brought him back out of Legends, completely emasculated him, turned him into a weak, pathetic, incompetent lapdog, then killed him without even letting him put up a fight. The disrespect is unbelievable. Maybe I could have forgiven this if he had allowed Scorch to actually put up a good fight, if we'd seen Scorch go 1v4 against the Bad Batch and hold his own for a while before finally being overpowered and killed, I may have been able to accept it. But this was pathetic, he didn't even get to fire a single shot. What an absolute joke, just like this entire show. Scorch and the possibility of seeing the rest of the Delta Squad was the only reason I even kept watching all this time, but in the end it was all for nothing. Thanks Filoni. So those are my thoughts on The Bad Batch Season 3 and I guess the show as a whole and how it depicts Scorch and the Republic Commandos. It's absolutely dreadful. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, like the video if you want to, subscribe at your own risk, and until next time keep your pen on the paper and your sword in the scabbard.